great to have you with us as we dive in today to Romans chapter 9. And we're actually going to go, we're going to cover, we're going to survey three chapters, Romans 9 to 11. Now, if you've been with us, you know that we've been in the book of Romans and really the first eight chapters of Romans is Paul focusing in on the condition of humanity in general, like God's uh, heart to redeem humanity. And those of you at Allgate will remember I preached there and we had a lemon tree, we had a dead lemon tree and we said, Paul's basically saying there's an issue at the heart of humanity and that issue is that we are dead. There is bad news, we're dead. But then he goes on and then the next few chapters he's really saying, but there's also good news and that good news is that there is hope, that there is salvation, there is this life in Christ, by grace, through faith in Christ. And chapter eight is this glorious chapter of like, you know, therefore there is now no condemnation, yeah? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we love to preach chapter eight. We don't always love to preach chapter 9, 10 and 11 because when you get to chapter 9, 10 and 11, really it's it's just part of one argument. So 9, 10, 11 is really like at at a high level, it's all, it's one thing. And what Paul's doing is he's shifting his focus from humanity in general and he turns his attention, he looks to Israel, his Jewish brothers and sisters And he is speaking to them specifically with a specific word and speaking about them. And so rather than than diving in deep, and I know we talked about nine a little bit because it raises some stuff, but I wanna wanna just take that bird's eye view. We're just gonna do a little surveillance of 9, 10, 11 in a message I'm titling God's Purpose and Plan for Israel. Who's keen? God's purpose and plan for Israel. Now, little caveat, because I realise that as we come to this, you probably fall into one of three categories. Everyone here will fall into one of three categories. Number one, you fall into the category of what I would call blind blinken from the cult classic Robin Hood Men in Tights. Anyone seen Robin Hood Men in Tights? Hilarious movie, absolute cult classic gold. Anyway, Blind Blinken, uh, he meets this guy along the road called a Chew, uh, <laughs> who's Dave Chappelle. And as he meets a Chew, he says, A Jew? Here? And so he's kind of like this naive, like ignorance, uh, but not in a bad way, just like, you know, to me, it's like, yeah, I, I realise that Israel's out there. I realise the Bible talks a bit about Israel. I realise some pretty horrible things happened to the Jewish people in the Holocaust. But apart from that, I'm kind of like neither here nor there. I haven't really dived into Israel and I'm just happy to just listen to a bloke, have a bit of a chat. And you fall into that category. I realise there's another category and that is that you have devoted an enormous amount of time and attention to the study of Israel. You have dived in uh, and you are very pro-Israel. You have like been investigating their place in history and the, I'm gonna use a big word here, the eschatological, everyone say eschatological. The eschatological timeline, it's just a fancy way of saying like what's gonna happen in the end of days, like end time stuff. And you've got a really like, a deep understanding and a, and a deep theology around their place there and are very passionate about it and zealous to see Israel flourish. That's great. There's also a group of you who are sitting in these two rooms right now who you look at Gaza and you look at the geopolitical tensions that exist right now between Israel and Palestine and that whole like Near Eastern region and you have some deep struggles with that. And so you may well be sitting here and saying, well, I'm actually not sure if Israel has a place in God's covenant theology anymore. That like, do they, is there still a heart of God for Israel or is he kind of done with them and 
and now it's about the church. And so we've got to understand that all three of those types of people are sitting in these two rooms as we, and online as we come to this topic. But can I say, this is exactly why we teach the Bible at Hills Baptist Church. This is why we don't jump from eight to 12 and just have a good time. We'll have a good time because God's Word is good. But it's really important that we actually look at 9, 10 and 11 because God speaks specifically into this stuff and it's so important that our opinions are formed by the Word, not the world. And so what we need to do as we approach this is we all need to come with soft, humble hearts. And you may disagree with what I say and that is okay. You... No, I'm not gonna say what I was gonna say. (laughs) You're allowed to disagree, but just commit to saying, let's look at the Word, let's dive into the Word, and let's let Romans 9, 10, and 11 speak to Israel, not our media, and not maybe hyper-Zionist movements. Let's just say, what does Paul want us to know about Israel? Because it's important to God. Who's with me? Now, just one other little thing. In the New Testament, Paul actually will say in various places, there's four things, four really important things that the church is not to be ignorant about. Four things. He uses the word, this idea of being ignorant in four separate things. The first is Satan's devices and the power of forgiveness. He says, don't be ignorant about Satan's devices and the power of forgiveness. That's 2 Corinthians 2. He also says, don't be ignorant about end times theology, specifically around how the dead will be raised up with Christ when Christ comes on the cloud, all right? And the church will be taken up with Him. He says, don't be ignorant about that, which means we need to study that, all right? That's 1 Thessalonians 4. He also says, don't be ignorant about the work and function of the Holy Spirit in the church. That's 1 Corinthians 12. And the last thing he says not to be ignorant about is God's heart for Israel and how it relates to the church. And that's right here in Romans 11. So we're not gonna be ignorant. We're not gonna dig our head in the sand. We're gonna actually dive in. We're gonna try and study this and unpack it together. And we're gonna say, Lord, what are you saying in this space? And I think we should pray. So let's stand to our feet. Lord, we love you and we praise you. and We thank you for your word. We thank you for Israel. We thank you that you have a, a purpose and a plan for them and for the church. We thank you for your promises and that your promises are yes and amen. And Lord, just help us to learn. We pray that Israel will be saved in Jesus' name. So we surrender this time to you in Jesus. Yeah, you just speak, Lord. Amen. Okay, let's, let's get into the Word. We're gonna go Romans 9, and as I said, we're gonna do a surveillance. So I'm gonna read the like eight verses of chapter nine, one to eight, then we'll jump over to 10, one to four, then we'll jump over to 11, and we'll go one to six. And then like uh, we're just gonna try and keep up and jump all over the place with the Word as we go. So reading from Romans 9, verse one. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. So Paul grieves. That's the first thing we gotta understand is as we read these three chapters, Paul's, this, Paul's posture is one of a deep, deep grief and burden and anguish for his people. And he is the apostle to the Gentiles. So let's just understand that, keep going. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. You see, he's just unleashed eight of the most glorious chapters 
about how it's no longer salvation by uh, works through the law, that it's no longer salvation. We don't have to earn our salvation. We don't uh, have to go through things like circumcision or, or become a Jew in order to be saved. He's done this incredible thesis on the gospel of grace through faith, yeah? That's what he's come to. So the question, he's anticipating a question. He's anticipating that a question would come to him and that that question would be, well, does that mean God has failed? Does that mean that, that God's plan and purpose through Israel has failed? And then he says, well, it is not as though the Word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. We'll get to that in a minute. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Jump over to chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not, to submit, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Jump over to chapter 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? You might wanna get a pen out, a highlighter out. By no means. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know that the Scripture says of Elijah how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and they have demolished your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. God's purpose and plan for Israel. So let's begin uh, just by looking like, what's the big deal? For some of you like, who fall in that Blinken category, what's the big deal with Israel? Who are they? What, like, why are they special? What's this idea of them being chosen? And just to give that survey, it comes back to Genesis 12, right? So in Genesis 12, God chooses a man by the name of Abram. Everyone say Abram. And the reason he chooses Abram is because Abram demonstrates faith. And he calls out Abram and he makes a covenant with Abram and he says, you're gonna be Abraham. So he changes his name. You're gonna be Abraham and through you, I will bless all the nations of the earth. And then Abraham fathered Isaac and Isaac fathered Jacob and Jacob wrestled with God and God changed his name from Jacob to Israel because Israel means the one who wrestles with God. Another way of translating that is one uh, whom God preserves. Another way of translating that is governed by God. That's what Israel means. And so Abraham by faith became a nation with a promise that through him, God would bless all the nations of the earth, that they would be a people unlike any other people, governed by God, chosen by Him to represent God on the earth, to be a people through which God's holiness and mercy and character and glory would be evident on the earth. A couple of passages, Deuteronomy 7, 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord our God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be His people, His treasured possession. 
Genesis 12, three, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Back to Romans 9, 4 and 5. What is Paul grieving? Because he says they are Israelites and to them belong adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises to them belong, the patriarchs and from their race, according to the flesh, the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. This Israel through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they go through some stuff, right? And as they go through some stuff, they end up having 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And then God raises up Moses to redeem them from slavery in Egypt. They experience the Exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea. Guess what? They reject God again. And so then they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And then they come to the Jordan and God raises up Joshua and He crosses them over the Jordan into the promised land. And they begin to take the land that God promised them way back with Abraham. And as they take the land and then God raises up for them judges and then they reject God again. And then they, you know, He raises up prophets and then they have kings and they've got good kings and bad kings and it goes well and then it goes poorly as they wrestle with God and submitting to Him. And eventually there's this exile and they're exiled off in, a, in Assyria. Firstly, uh, uh, sorry, I should say, firstly, there's a split <laughs> between northern and southern kingdoms and then Assyria takes the northern kingdom and then eventually Babylon overthrows the southern kingdom, Judah, and they're exiled. And then 70 years later, they, this remnant returns and they begin to rebuild the, the altar and then the temple and then the wall, that's Ezra and Nehemiah. And then there's like this period where it's like, again, this period of 400 years of silence and then you come to the gospels and something happens. Jesus. Yeah, come on. One person's excited about Jesus in this house. Jesus. And what we have to understand, this whole thing, this chose, they are a royal priesthood, a chosen nation. Why? So that the nations on the earth will be blessed. How? Because through them, Yeshua, Meshiach, Jesus, the Messiah, comes to the earth to redeem humanity from the curse of sin and death. God chose Israel to be the ones in their wrestle with Him through which, in, like through many dangers, toils and snares, and through all sorts of quirky cats, like read the beginning of Matthew, in the most unexpected of ways, through the most unexpected of people, God brings His Messiah for the salvation of humanity. Friends, and because of that, we honour Israel and we bless them. In the same way, we honour Mary and we speak well of Mary, because she was chosen by God to be the literal vessel through whom the Messiah came. We don't worship her. We don't venerate her, but we honour her. Same is true with Israel. We don't worship Israel. We don't say Israel can do no wrong, because let me tell you, they're doing some wrong. But we do honour them, and we do speak blessing over them. Jesus came. They were God's chosen people for that time. So... Well, what about now? Let me throw some questions that I think uh, you might be having. Does God still have a purpose and plan for Israel? Are they still chosen? Do they have special access to God because of their ethnicity? Or uh, do they also need Jesus? And if they need Jesus, does that mean the promises God gave to Israel have now been transferred to the church? Has the church replaced Israel. That, great questions, everybody. <laughs> great questions. Guess what? Every one of them are answered in chapters 9, 10, and 11. So let's start, where do we begin here? Let's start with the access to God and salvation. Let's start there. Do they have special access to God and salvation because of their ethnicity? Chapter 9, verse 30. Come with me. You there? What shall we say then? 
that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued the law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Who is the stumbling stone? Jesus. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Jump over to verse four. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. Paul is saying something. He's saying that there is only one way to be saved. And that is through faith in Jesus Christ. Friends, the Bible, we say this all the time. The Bible is a unified story that points to Jesus, right? God's covenant promise is that He is creating a people for Himself, not two peoples for Himself. Galatians 3, 28, 29, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. God's, God's covenant is not divided. There aren't two doors into salvation. There's only one door and that is the body of Christ. There's only one way to access salvation that is by placing our faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. And this is why Paul's heart is so grieved because he's like, I've been preaching this gospel and my own people, God's chosen people have rejected it. And they're falling away from that. And so he longs for them to be saved. He longs that they would see clearly they have everything, the prophets, the promises, the patriarchs, the worship, the Lord, they've got everything and they're stumbling over the rock who is Jesus Christ, which is why Paul says not all of Israel is Israel. He's saying there's a difference between national identity and spiritual identity. And the only way to be saved, the only way to be governed by God is to be subject to his Messiah, King Jesus. And it's really important that we understand that. Ethnicity does not lead to salvation. Faith, by the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ, is the only way that we are saved. But watch this. This is so important. Watch this. That does not mean that Israel are no longer chosen. It does not mean mean that his promises to Israel have failed and that they no longer have a part to play in God's story. It's awfully quiet in this Baptist church. Hear me, as I read Scripture and as we read 9 to 11, there's one way to be saved. But Paul wants to make it very clear that the church has not replaced Israel we have been engrafted into Israel. God still has a purpose and a plan for His chosen people and we are blessed through the Messiah to enter into it. How are we going for 10.30 on a Sunday morning to be teaching the Bible? We are all right? This is so important for us to grasp. It's so important because there has been a doctrine that has risen up in the church. And again, you might disagree with me, but as I read the Bible, as we read this, I think it's, I don't think this doctrine is true. And the doctrine is called supersessionism. Everyone say supersessionism or, or replacement theology. And it's a doctrine that says the church has replaced Israel, that Israel no longer has a purpose and a plan in God's providential uh, purposes of redeeming the earth. It's saying he's done with them and now it's just the church. I don't think that's what Paul is teaching. I can't see that in the scripture. Why? Because Romans 11, I ask, has God rejected his people? Three words, by no means. He's saying, no, 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 I haven't. 
rejected Israel. I haven't replaced Israel. I, that promise is still rooted. But what's happened is, and he goes into some detail here, is that the church has been engrafted into the blessing of Israel. And Israel still has a part to play. God's not forgotten. But the craziness is a part of that part to play is actually that their stubbornness and their rejection, their stumbling over the stumbling stone is actually the means through which the gospel goes to the very ends of the earth. Come to Romans 11 verse 25. It's very teachy this morning, but I think it's important. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of of the Gentiles has come in. God has actually partially hardened Israel. Israel in rejecting God's God's covenant Messiah has actually led to the gospel going out. Like Paul's like in this, in the book of Acts, there's this moment where Paul's like, I am done with you. Even though he prays from his heart, he's like, I am gonna take this to the, to the, the Gentiles. And so it's actually, Israel still has a part to play because their hearts will be hardened and that part to play is that until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and then watch this and in this way, verse 26, all Israel will be saved and it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob and this will be my covenant with them when I take their sins away. There's this moment right now where the gospel's going to the ends of the earth, but a moment will come when the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. When that fullness, when every person that that gospel's gone to has said, yes, Jesus is Lord, then God will move upon Israel and they will be moved to repentance and they will see the Messiah for who He is and they will fall on their knees and they will say, you are the one who is the fulfilment of the law and Israel's hearts will be turned back to Christ, to Yahweh. Can I show you something? Can we put uh, Douglas Moo, who's a commentator, I think he provides a really helpful summary of Romans 11. Can we just put that up? It, it's, it's Romans 11, 11 to 12. There's, there's this threefold pattern. We all good? Can we keep going? Yeah. Romans 11, 11 and 12, you see that there's this idea of a trespass of Israel, which leads to salvation for Gentiles, but then leads to the fullness of Israel coming in. Verse 15, he speaks, Paul speaks of Israel's rejection leading to the reconciliation of the world, which then leads to Israel's acceptance. Romans eleven seventeen to 23. Natural branches are broken off. Wild shoots are grafted in. Natural branches are grafted back in. Romans eleven twenty five 25 to 26. There is a hardening of Israel. There is the fullness of Gentiles. And then there is all of Israel will be saved. Romans eleven thirty 30 to 31. It's there's a disobedience of Israel. There is mercy for Gentiles and there is mercy to Israel. Do you think Paul's trying to communicate something? When you repeat something over and over and over and over again, it's because he wants you to get it. That there is a purpose for Israel in their hardening so that, we can come to know Jesus, so ultimately they will come back to Jesus. Yeah? Can we have the gardening diagram up? Now, I'm no gardener. I've tried for 15 years to grow a lemon, and I still can't flip and well do it. I've tried so hard, like every time we think we're on the way, we planted a, what we thought was a lime tree. It turned out to be a grapefruit. Like, <laughs> I'm no gardener. And I don't know how clearly you can see this, but this is what Paul's talking about in Romans 11. It's this idea that there is a messianic branch rooted 
in Abraham. And that messian, and that's the idea of the Nazarite. Nazarite means stick, fascinatingly enough. Another message we could go down. There's a messianic branch. Now what's happened is, Israel's been broken off for a season, but the roots are still there. The Gentiles have been grafted in. I don't know how that works. Talk to someone who's a gardener in this house. I'm sure that they'll help you. But Israel, this wild branch of Gentiles is grafted in and that begins to flourish through faith. But a season is coming when the remnant of Israel, the natural olive branch, will return to its root. And then we will have not two trees, but one. I'll I'll put this in the weekly email for those of you who get the weekly email and you can see it. And listen to me. There'll be one olive tree. This is represented in Revelation 4 and 5 of the picture of heaven where there are 24 thrones around the throne of God. Not 12, 24. Not divided, united. It is a picture of Israel and the church united as in the promise of God that we would be a royal priesthood ministering before the Lord. That's what God is doing. How are we going? Hills Baptist Church. Okay, you were right. Good. So, what does this mean for us? If there's still a purpose and plan for Israel, if God's promises are not dead, if the church hasn't replaced Israel but been engrafted into Israel, why should I care? <laughs> what does it mean for us? And Ben, you can come up. Well, let me start. If you're a non-Christian here or listening at Orgay or listening online, if you're a non-Christian, listen to me. As I read Scripture, and again, you might choose to disagree with me. Let's sit down, have a coffee, open the Word and chat. But as I read Scripture, the last prophecy necessary in in the Bible for Jesus to return for His church, Ezekiel 36, 37 is where the dry bones come to life and where what was completely dead and scattered becomes one. I think there's a picture of that of what God did in Israel in 1948 and returning them to their land, that He brought life out of complete and utter death. And that we see this. Now, let's just put down geopolitical disagreements and there's a lot of yucky stuff that's gone on over the last 70 years in that space. But God has fulfilled that prophecy. That's the last thing that had to happen in order for Jesus to come back. So what's the hold up? What's the, no, the hold up is, is 25. There's a partial hiding until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. God is not slow as we perceive it, but He is patient, not wanting any to perish. Listen, if you're not a Christian, give your life to Jesus. You might be the one person we're all waiting for. So just repent. Give your life to Jesus so we can all go home. So we'll come back. Come back, Lord Jesus. He's waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in. Repent. Give your life to Jesus so He can finish up what He started. He's not slow, He's patient. How awesome is our God? If you're a non-Christian, repent, give your life to Christ. There is no other way to be saved but by accepting Jesus as Lord. Listen to me, listen to me. If you are a Christian, what does this mean? It means pray for Israel. Chapter 10, it's what it's all about. Pray for Israel. Don't curse Israel, regardless of the geopolitical view. Don't curse them. Pray for them. Pray for them that the remnant would be raised up, that the Spirit of God would move and that these people who have been stumbling over the stumbling stone would be renewed in Christ. Let's pray for them because when they're renewed in Christ, The Middle East will be totally, radically transformed. Like God wants Israel to return to Himself. Our job is to pray. Our job is to proclaim the good news to the world. 
Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. The only way that the fullness of the Gentiles is gonna come in is not just by us praying for Israel, but by us proclaiming the Gospel to the ends of the earth. We have a job to do. So let's proclaim the good news. This is chapter 10. How will they know unless someone tells them? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We have a job to do if you're a Christian. Proclaim the good news of the Gospel. And let's pray for Israel. Let's bless Israel because those who bless Israel will be blessed. Those who curse Israel will be cursed. I don't wanna curse them. I wanna bless them. I wanna see them flourish. That doesn't mean I just go, yeah, do what you're doing because they're doing some not very good things. Things that I think are contrary to God's heart. So let's pray for them, yeah? Let's pray for Israel, pray for a turning and a repentance that they would see Jesus and it will happen, it will happen. And I said in our prayer time this morning, I promise I'm gonna finish. I said in our prayer time this morning, there's this incredible passage in Zechariah going to read it. Zechariah verse chapter 12 from verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. God's heart is for Israel. God's heart is for the church. That through the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the day would come when we would be one before His throne. So let's get praying. Let's get proclaiming. And let's not allow this sort of stuff to divide us. Let's be united in that shared common purpose. Because we can sit here and debate and yell at one another about all the different things, but it's pretty simple. Pray and proclaim and wait until God comes again. Redeem it all. Let's stand to our feet. Okay, we love you. God bless you. I'll hand over to your host now to lead in a time of prayer and worship. Thank you for joining us. For us, let's pray. Lord, we love you. And I really do pray right here, right now, if there's anyone here, who has not bowed the knee to the Saviour, that You will reveal Yourself to them. Later on in Zechariah, they come to the one who was pierced and they say, look at his back and they say, where did you get your wounds? Jesus responds and He says, in the house of my friends, you were wounded for our transgressions, pierced for our iniquities. Lord, turn our hearts towards You. Oh, forgive us that so often we divide and we bicker over doctrines when you just say just get on your knees and ask me to come and do what I promised I would do unify us around that common purpose Lord redeem Israel and thank you for your grace of engrafting us in to the beautiful promise of new creation. How we love you. How we praise you. How we thank you.
bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we will sing in a second, but just one last thing. Uh, last, last weekend, I had the privilege, I was speaking at a conference um, and they worked me hard, right? Like I preached, I think it was four sermons and did like four or five panels over the course of two days. It was a big weekend. And as I got to, and I, like antibiotics had kicked in, I was starting to feel a little bit better. Uh, but I was still feeling like pretty weak and a bit feverish every now and then. And I got to about four o'clock on Sunday afternoon, sitting in a prayer meeting. I was just like, oh Lord, <laughs> I am tired and uh, I do not feel myself. And I know he'd given me a word for this community. I was like, Lord, you've given me a word, but I don't know how I'm going to do this. And as I was sitting there and we were praying, I just, you know, that interrupting thought just came into mind and it just said, get up. So I got up. I went, all right, I'll stand up. And as I stood up, it was like, like a spiritual IV just hit my veins. And I'm like physically in that moment, it was like I went, oh, I'm back. Like just like vitalised. And I've been thinking, that just sort of sat with me. God did great things Sunday night, like amazing. Just poured out His presence on His people and it was incredible time but on the plane on Monday I was sitting there like and I couldn't shake this conviction that just maybe we as a church needed a needed to create some space for healing and then as I've been prepping this message and thinking about the heart to pray for Israel the heart to pray for the nations I couldn't shake this conviction that we need to create space for healing so here's what we're going to do we're going to have a time to pray now but next Sunday we're going to have a different service It's going to be a healing service. I don't know what it's going to look like just yet. We'll figure that out. But it will be different. We'll sing some songs. I'll bring a little bit of like foundational work in the Word. But we're going to create space. We'll probably have, you know, just courtyard and here, an opportunity to, if you need healing, to be prayed for healing. An opportunity to pray for others for healing, to pray for physical, spiritual, emotional healing, to pray for healing for the nations and to pray healing for our nation because there is a wound at the heart of our nation that needs healing. And we're going to create space next week. And I want to encourage you, get in the room next week. I just have such a conviction that the Spirit of God is going to do something very powerful in our midst as we seek His face for healing. So we, that's going to be next week. But we don't have to wait till next week. Let's pray now. Let's worship God and let's pray now. And if if you've got a heart, something burning in your heart to pray for someone, or if you would like prayer, let's do that now as we sing to God.